Let's talk about some properties of integrals. To be able to evaluate integrals, we can use the following properties. Suppose f and g are integrable functions, then the following hold true. So property 1 says that if I take the integral from a to a of f of x dx, that's equal to 0. And that should make some sense. Regardless of whatever function I have, if I'm looking at it from a instead of a to some other number b, if I'm looking at, at the same value, then the width of my rectangle is essentially 0, regardless of what the height is. So 0 times the height is just going to be 0. So that's property 1. Property 2 says that if you have the definite integral from b to a of f of x dx, that is equal to the negative or negative 1 times the integral from a to b of the same function. So if I swap the limits of integration, I just have to make sure that I multiply by negative 1, and then those things are equivalent. Property 3 says if I am taking the definite integral of a constant function, then that's equal to c times b minus a, where c is any constant. Now let's think about this. I have my y-axis and my x-axis. A constant function, if I were to graph it, forms a horizontal line. And so this is the line y equals c. And if I'm looking at the area underneath the curve from a to b, then it's just going to form a rectangle. And the area of this rectangle is its width would be b minus a, and then its height would be c. So that's how we get c times b minus a. Property 4 says that if I'm taking the definite integral from a to b of the sum of two functions, I can actually take that and split it up into two separate definite integrals, which is really nice. And this is actually analogous to a property that we saw in the theorem for summations. In other words, if I have a sum of something like ai plus bi, then that's equal to the sum of ai plus the sum of bi. So it's stemming from that property from summations. Similarly, uh, when we're dealing with definite integrals, if we have a constant, we can pull out the constant outside of our definite integral. Again, this is stemming from the theorems and properties we learn from summations. Similar to property 4, if I have the difference of two functions and I'm integrating that, I can split that up into the first definite integral minus the second definite integral. And then property 7 says that if you are looking at the definite integral of a function from a to c, you can break it up, or excuse me, from a to b, you can break it up into two definite integrals like that. So what does that mean in terms of if we were trying to visualize that? So if I have some function from a to b here, and then I have some intermediate value c, if I wanted to look at the entire area from a to b underneath my curve, that would be here. But I could also break it up into two different integrals. And so the first integral would be here the second integral would be here, and if I added those together, that would give me the total area underneath the curve. So that's essentially what property 7 is saying. Now let's talk about some comparison properties. The above properties are true for any a value less than b, a equals b, or a greater than b. The following properties are only true if a is less than or equal to b. So property 8 says if we're looking at a positive function for the, inter the closed interval from a to b, then the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx has to be greater than or potentially equal to 0. But that should make sense because if I'm looking at a function that's entirely above the x-axis or potentially touching the x-axis, if I take the area underneath it, the area is going to be positive because I don't have any part of my function going beneath the x-axis. Property 9 says if I have two functions where the first function is greater than or equal to the second function on some closed interval from a to b, then the definite integral from a to b of the first function has to be greater than or equal to 
the definite integral of the second function, which again, that should make sense. And the tenth property, the tenth comparison property says, if you have a function that's bounded below by some number lowercase m and bounded above by some capital M for the closed interval from A to B, then the definite integral is greater than or equal to lowercase m times b minus a, and the definite integral is less than or equal to capital M times b minus a. So property 10 is useful when all we want is a rough estimate of the size of an integral without using the midpoint rule. If some function f is continuous, we can take lowercase m and capital M to be the absolute min and max values of f on the interval from a to b. This property says that the area under the graph, uh, the area under the graph of f is greater than the area of the rectangle with height m or lowercase m and less than the area of the rectangle with height capital M. And so here's a really nice visualization of property 10. So if this value here is the absolute max of our function, then the area underneath the curve y equals f of x has to be less than or equal to the area of the rectangle with height capital M. And then here, if that is the absolute min, then the area underneath the curve has to be at least the area of this rectangle, this small rectangle here, with height lowercase m, which is again the absolute min in this scenario. Example 4 says, evaluate the definite integral from negative 5 to positive 5 of the integrand x minus the square root of 25 minus x squared dx by interpreting it in terms of areas. Now, if we were to try to integrate this using the Riemann definition like we did on the previous page, it would be quite challenging. Luckily for us, we should be able to know how to visualize this. So first off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use property 6, and I'm going to separate this into two different integrals. So this would be the integral from negative 5 to positive 5 of x dx, and then minus the integral from negative 5 to positive 5 of the square root of 25 minus x squared dx. And we have two functions now. We have x and we have the square root of 25 minus x squared. And we should be able to graph both of these functions. So let's do that. All right, so I went ahead and I graphed both of our functions. The first function is y equals x, which is a linear function. And then our other function is y equals the square root of 25 minus x squared. and this you should recognize from maybe like a pre-calculus class. The formula for a circle, if it's centered at the origin, is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So if I solve this, because right now x squared plus y squared equals r squared is not a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. So let's say I want to put it in explicit form and solve for y. If I subtract both sides by x squared, I'd get y, y squared equals r squared minus x squared. Then I can take the square root of both sides, and I'd get y equals plus or minus the square root of r squared minus x squared. And remember from like pre-calculus that r is equal to the radius of the circle. And notice that we have a plus or minus. The plus is the upper half of our circle, and the minus represents the lower half of our circle. So if I just have y equals the positive square root of 25 minus x squared, then that's going to be the upper half of the circle. And 25 here represents r squared, which would mean if I took the square root of both sides, the radius of my circle would be 5. And so that's what we have graphed here. We have the upper half of a circle, 
that's centered at the origin and has a radius of 5. So how can we find the definite integral by looking at these two graphs? Well, these are geometric shapes that we should know the areas of. So here, this green triangle here, let's calculate its area. So its height is 5, and then its base is also 5, and I know that because we have the line y equals x, so that means that this point here should be 5 comma 5, because the x and the y value, or the x coordinate and the y coordinate are the same. And then here, that ordered pair is negative 5 comma negative 5, which means that it has dimensions of 5 by 5. So let's erase this because there's a lot of stuff on there. Both of these, the green triangle has an area of 5, and the red triangle also has an area of 5. But remember, we're taking the green and we're subtracting off the red, and 5 minus 5 is 0. So this part of my definite integral is 0, and then I want to subtract off whatever that area is. And let's look at the second graph. So I have half of a circle. I know that the area of a circle in general is equal to pi r squared. So the area of a semicircle should be pi r squared over 2. And our radius is 5, so 5 squared is 25. And then we're dividing that by 2. So our second definite integral here is 25 pi over 2. So our final answer is going to be negative 25 pi over 2. And that concludes this example.